Hello, and welcome to the Secure AF podcast, the podcast about all things cybersecurity. My name is Todd Wadel. I'm our Director of Communications, and I'm here with Jonathan Kimmett, our CISO. Today, we thought we would talk about um, what to do after an incident, whether that's a simulated phishing attack, a real phishing attack, um, a breach. We've talked a lot about the technical elements of how do you restore your network, but there's also the human element of how do you respond to your people? How do you, what are the best practices for what to do with them to restore after the breach and the way forward? So Jonathan, I'm gonna let you kick it off. Maybe your experience or general principles that you would say are helpful. Well, um, I would say that, you know, we got a couple of different things when we're talking about an incident, you know, and we're, uh, you, you kind of rattle them off. You know, you got a phishing incident, you've got breaches, you have network outages, you have, uh, business continuity issues, you have all different kinds of things. And and first and foremost, whenever we're dealing with any sort of incident, uh, people come first. You know, that has been my, you know, kind of my mantra. Um, I put that on all my slides. Uh, in fact, I'm doing a, a, a incident response class here in a few hours uh, for a conference. And, you know, that is the first thing that goes on to the slide. You know, take care of people. First of all, are people safe? And honestly, I have that as the very last thing on that same slide. So, you know, is, uh, are people safe? Did you initiate a command? Have you done this? Have you done this? Have you turned return? Have you done a report after action? And the very bottom one is, are people okay? Um, and I think it's really important to understand that when we're going through an incident, um, regardless of the type of incident it is, you have to maintain that, um, that awareness and that, that connection with, with your staff, with your incident response team and make sure number one, they're capable of going through it. Cause some people just aren't, I mean, the stress can be overwhelming sometimes. Uh, number two, they may not be comfortable doing a particular incident. Uh, and what I mean by that is in some cases you have to investigate other people, uh, investigate, uh, maybe their coworkers or people that they know or they work with. And sometimes people aren't comfortable with that. Uh, you have the issue of um, the stress of the incident, just working hours upon hours. Uh, my big thing is, yeah, you only want to work people eight hours because after about eight hours, people are not making good decisions. So you need to rotate them out and let them get some sleep. Uh, I worked an incident here a couple of weekends ago, about two weekends ago, actually. And at about nine o'clock at night, um, I was on a call and while I wasn't directly involved in the incident, I was help guiding, you know, people and, uh, you could tell people were not responding well. They, 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 they were slow in terms of the response. If you asked them a question, they were getting confused, they were getting frustrated. So I stopped everybody on the call, which was probably 10 or so people. I was like, when was the last time everybody ate? And two or three people said it was breakfast and it was 10 o'clock at night. And it's like, all right, we're at a point now we need to stop. You all need to go eat and you need to go home and get some rest because you're just, and that can make an incident worse. If you're having bad decisions being made by the team, by your people, you can have your incident can get worse. So we, uh, I sent them home, um, and I told them you need to go get food. You need to go home, take a shower, go to bed. Don't work on this. Uh, they did not listen to me. They worked on into the night, um, which really irritated me. Um, it didn't help anything necessarily on the other end. They found some more information, which was great, but I truly wanted them to get some sleep. So, you know, those are the types of things that I think about during an incident response. Um, and that's not even going, uh, you know, after action report, mm -hmm. that's just during the incident, how people are responding, um, how they're making good decisions. The other thing to think about is when you, when you are having an incident, if you have a single person who is responsible for a thing, uh, maybe it's a single network engineer or a single infrastructure engineer or whatever, and they don't have backup and they don't have anybody to collaborate with, that weighs on them 
because they're the only person that can do that job. And they're the only ones that if they mess it up, nothing moves forward. So I always try to encourage, have backups, have two or three people. Also have people there to collaborate. Um, I know I've worked incidents in the past where it wasn't my incident. You know, it was somebody else who was managing it. You know, it was an outage or something like that. And I just went in to be that soundboard for the network engineer um, to help them talk it out. I knew enough to, to engage with them. Um, I could have done it, but I helped them be that, that collaborative person. Um, and it took a lot, of, I felt like it took a lot of stress off him because he wasn't alone. Yeah. So those are the sorts of things that I think about during an incident that I think are really important. And too many people, all they care about is resolving it, getting you back up and running, which is important. But people, I believe people are more important. Yeah, I think that's really helpful in realizing that everybody involved does have that human element. And hackers are very aware of that. So, you know, there there are certain times of day that people are more susceptible to phishing attacks. Yes. And so part of that's time of day, part of that's have you eaten, part of that did you just eat. And so knowing that the attacker is aware of that, so on the defensive side, we should be aware of that too. And I think to what you said about um, just needing that collaboration, having watched our guys work incident responses... Uh, one, the, the time, hey, I've been working on this 10 hours. Somebody else, I, I really should take over for that. I got to go yeah. get some sleep. Yeah. But also how maybe it's just that somebody else catches something that yeah. you, you maybe ordinarily would have caught. Yep. But you're tired, you're sleepy, you're hungry, or you're just feeling the stress. Um, yeah. I know one thing that happens often is an incident will happen. Our guys will get on the phone. And sometimes it doesn't even lead to an incident response because one of our guys is going to, you know, able to look and say, have you checked this, this, and this? And yep. there, there are things that might seem obvious and they would if you weren't in the stress of the incident response. Yeah. Yeah. But you're thinking, I don't know where it happened. I've got to fix this. What's my first step? Instead of slow down a little bit, if we can help them identify those things, they actually don't need us because, oh, here's something easy. You can go do that. Yep. Great. We want to help in that way. But you're right, if they're alone, if they're solo, or even if there's a team, but they haven't been equipped, they haven't been trained, maybe there's, like you said, a, a policy and procedure, but it hasn't been tested. Right. So they're scrambling, where is our policy? Where does it exist? What do I do next? They need that outside voice or just a collaborative voice to say, okay, let's look at this, this, and this. Yep. Now we can do something about it. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm a huge proponent of the incident command system the when you're building when you have an incident response actually building your incident command structure here you know, you've got incident commander and then you've got operations logistics and you have kind of the whole gambit um and i think that's really really critical for modern incident response you know it, it's we have done incident response i have personally done incident response since mid 2000s as part of the computer security response team. Um, and I've done I, I, thousands of responses. And, and some of them were very minor. Some of them were multi-day. Some of them were multi-year, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, court cases and things like that you have to do on these things. And, you know, early on, it was, uh, you know, it, when I joined the team, the CSRT, uh, there was four, I, I made five, so there's four people in me. And uh, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, no one knew what we were doing in terms of computer security. We had one person who was pretty good at figuring stuff out, and he kind of led the team. But we grew. But it was that collaboration that really helped us as we because we were doing stuff that no one had done. I remember, this is, a, this is a funny story, but this is just kind of like the moment. We... Uh, we found a problem, um, and uh, we found it. We were on our Wireshark, so Wireshark was doing a packet capture, and uh, first time we'd ever done that at that organization. So we were in the uh, Wireshark. We found a problem. We thought it was a problem anyway, and so we decided that this is going to sound funny. 
I hope he never listens to this because he's going to he's going to get mad that I, I told it in this way. We thought there was a hacker on the network, and we were going to shut it down. So we literally stormed a guy's office with security. I mean, we busted in and uh, get off the keyboard, and we yanked the computer. Well, it turns out, um, and for those of you that go, go back this far, when you're dealing with uh, early Windows networks, you had this concept of a master browser computer. And this computer, other computers talk to it to do some stuff, and then it goes out. So um, I'm not going to get into the specifics of it because it's not important, but his computer was the master browser for that little network. And, uh, oh, man, he was mad. He was mad. He was embarrassed. But we didn't know any better. Um, so that really had nothing, no bearing on the actual, uh, you know, the topic of the day, except for the fact that we were learning together and we were making mistakes. But it was good to have that 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 collaboration to really decide this. Because so, after that, we was like, oh, that was Master Browser. Now we understand that better. <laughs> we're not going to make that mistake again. Um, when that person left, I became kind of the lead of the computer security response team. And that really what led me into being a CISO later in the years. But that team was all that it was really important because we would spend late nights together in an office working, you know, to, you know, we had our full-time jobs. Then we did the, the team after that. And it was a learning experience, but it was also a trust that I trusted him them, him specifically, and we went back and forth. When he left and I became the lead, I didn't have that anymore. So I had to rebuild a team to have that camaraderie, to have that collaboration. Because there are things that you do during incident response that if you're trying to do it by yourself, it sucks. And you don't want to do it. That's why people burn out. Um, Now, that said, um, as you're otherwise building this team, um, you uh, you have to look out for one another, you know, look out for the safety of one another for one thing. Uh, you said it earlier about having someone just having another set of eyes. It really sucks to go through a log file of 60, 65,000 lines of log and trying to find that one line that shows, ah, this is where the person got in. And so you kind of have to get over your ego to where I will look through the log and then I will hand it to you and have you look through the log because you might catch it when I didn't, you know, and it's all about dealing with the situation. I personally have to get out of that mode of, oh, I didn't find anything. It's like, no, 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 I didn't find it, but maybe he did. And if he doesn't find it, maybe you ask a third person to go through it because you're looking for that needle in a haystack. So that becomes really helpful because you can have that support, have that collaboration, have that second set of eyes. Um, well, I, that seems helpful because even if you know how to do it, how many times have you done it? So you may say, I know how to look through these logs. I haven't done that in a year. Yes. So yes, yes, yes. even though you have the training and the equipping, if you don't have that experience in, in a fairly immediate time yep. frame, Okay, I'm having to essentially relearn. Right. So I think that that's the ego part, right? Too is I, I do know I am an expert, but I haven't touched this in a while. Yep. So I really need somebody else to help me with that. Yep. And everyone does it a little different. You know, I am very much a command line person. You know, when I look through logs, I want to do it at the command line. I want to, you know, cat it and grep it and do all kinds of stuff. Um, the the networking guy that I was talking about earlier that I was uh, he was an Excel guy. He wanted to get into Excel and do, you know, great. You know, we both do it different ways. Um, and one of us will find it, you know, sometimes it's just luck, you know, he found it or I found it, but you know, sometimes it was easier for me to do things quicker than it was for him to do it in Excel. Maybe it was easier for him to turn that into graphics and to turn it into a, a, a model for us. So, I mean, it, everyone has slightly different skill sets but it can all be useful when you're trying to get that job done. And it's, again, it's support. You're supporting one another to do it. So that speaks a lot to the importance of people in the middle of an incident. Yes. Let's, let's talk about after the incident. So everything's resolved on the network side, or at least 
mostly, or you're at least to a point of calm, maybe. What? How does that impact the way that um, network administrators, CISOs, other suite, suite people should think about interacting with the people who were both involved in the incident response? Um, how did that go? You know, what, what was their response? But also maybe if there was someone who was the cause of the incident. Yes. How do you how do you think about people first in those respects? So let's do it on the team first, okay. and then we'll get into the the people who may not be on the team. Um, so your after action report um, for any sort of incident um, that will include your incident log, will include uh, your root cause analysis, will include the, you know the different pieces you need to have for that report. It should also have a section on there about people. How did the team do? Um, what can we do better to improve the team? Um, and that could be a lot of different things. It could be that you need better facilities for the team to, to help for collaboration. I spent a fair amount of time building our IR room at my previous job because it was that important to me. And it worked great for incidents because because I built it over several incidents. It's like, okay, we didn't have this. We need to put that in the room. Ah, shoot, we didn't have this thing. We need to put. So you need to take those notes and have that in your incident log, your incident report. But um, when you are talking about people, um, how they responded, how they um, reacted, you have to uh, you have to understand that every incident is a learning experience for the organization. There's also a, a, a learning experience for the the person. Maybe they need more incident response training. Um, maybe they need more um, stress training. You know, and and dealing with stress is a trainable thing. You know, people can learn how to deal with that. Um, maybe they need more communication skills. They found the problem, but they couldn't tell us. Mm -hmm. They didn't know how to tell. They didn't know how to, um, maybe they need KSAs, you know, knowledge, skills, and abilities. So that that after action report, that postmortem, whatever you want to call it, there needs to be a section in there of how did the team do and what can we do to do better with the team? And I, I really encourage people to not only talk about the specific skill sets, they need more networking people, they need more playbooks, they need, but also how did they do it as people? You know, how did they respond to that? Did they respond well? Again, I said earlier, some people just can't do it. Um, the stress gets to them. Um, I have I have seen people who, I don't want to say they had a mental breakdown because that's not the way it was. They had so much stress on that. It affected them at a personal level and at an, an employment level. You know, they just couldn't, ha you know, handle it after that. Uh, they were so afraid of the incident. They were so afraid of this happening again that it just, it, they second guess themselves. They, so you have to really analyze that. You know, as a manager, as an incident commander, as a leader, our goal is to improve the organization from the incident. Well, not only do you have to improve on the technical level, you have to improve on the compliance level, you also have to improve at that personal level. How can you improve that team? Um, what I tell people to do, um, and I tell them all the time, you need to do, you know, three or four tabletops a year of all different kinds. Uh, you might have one tabletop where you bring in a third party to lead it. This is an all day thing. They go through this process, but you need to have multiple tabletops throughout the year to make sure people, number one, know the process of incident response. And they know how they're going to react. They know what job they need to do and how they're going to react at that job. Because if they get really nervous and stressed out at a tabletop, they're probably not going to be as successful at a real incident response. Um, I can tell you. So let me tell you about how I deal with incident response. Um, I've been very fortunate um, uh, of my training uh, in, in my past and my pre, you know, CISO days and, and, and pre IT days that I've had exposure to incidents of a variety of kinds. The incident usually doesn't hit, the adrenaline rush of an incident usually doesn't hit me until after the incident. Um, so if we have, let's say, a small incident, we're working all day on it. Uh, we get it resolved by the end of the day. 
usually at about hour two after I'm home, it just hammers me, you know, and I go down, I, I sleep, I'm, you know, I'm hungry. I, the adrenaline rush, you know, the heart races, um, and, and, and that could be really good during the incident because you don't get excited during the incident. You just, okay, just do this, let's do this, let's do this. But that can absolutely take a toll on you afterward because it, you know, like when I'm driving home from Oklahoma city, it'll hit me while I'm driving yeah. home and that heart will race and it'll just, because now I am coming back off of that incident, that, that mindset. And my body is now like, okay, now we're going to go in fight or flight mode. Um, so, uh, that's how I react. Not everyone does that. I've seen people where the first of the incident, man, they are, they are useless. They, they, they can't respond. They can't answer questions. They can't even talk to you because they're so nervous. I've had one person once who, uh, I guess he thought he was going to get fired, but he started shaking so bad. You could hear his teeth clatter in the room. Uh, but I had to pull him out and I was like, okay, let's go. You know, you come with me. I had to get somebody to take him and go calm him down. Um, one of the reasons why I don't like caffeine in this and it responds for us, by the way, is because people get on that, ca- they get ha- hyped up on caffeine and it just makes it worse. You know, if they're like that, it just makes it worse. Anyway, side note. Um, wait, you're going to try to keep engineers away from <laughs> caffeine? No, 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 no. That seems like a that seems like a Herculean task. Uh, it, it is, and I would never do that. However, um, during so during incident responses, my big thing is I want to bring in lots of healthy, yeah. good food from multiple places. And I say this all the time. Everyone rolls their eyes at me when you have an incident. Don't bring up one restaurant's food. Get three. And only let people pick one of them to eat. That way, if they have a, you know, if there is a problem with food poisoning or whatever, you haven't lost your whole team. But bring in healthy, um, protein-rich meals. Bring in lots of water. They're going to have caffeine, but try to supplement that with good food. And that way, they're 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 firing on all all cylinders. You know, not just hyped up on the on the caffeine. And it seems like part of what you're saying is, I'd imagine. It's one thing to have your incident response plan, but then it's who do you have in the room? So you may have a plan that you think this works great. Does it actually reflect, can it be implemented by the people we have? And it seems like that could either adjust, we need different staff or more yes. training, or maybe maybe our plan needs to adjust because of yes. our own maturity, the team we have, the personalities in the room. Um, so it seems like there's an interrelation between those two yes. that the plan has to actually reflect the people you have. Well, absolutely. And here's the thing. Uh, everybody has a plan until it hits. Right. And, you know, that's kind of funny. We say it all the time, but it's the absolute truth. I have gone into organizations where I first thing I did is I asked them, where's your incident response plan? And they pulled it out. They haven't done anything on the plan. They, they've just completely ignored it. I was like, okay, well that's, you know, that that's not as helpful. Um, my philosophy is those tabletops or practice of that plan is critical. If you don't practice it, if people don't know the steps, if you don't have an incident command structure, that stuff, if you don't, if it's not ingrained in what you're doing day to day to day to day, then you're not going to do it when, when it really counts. If you don't test the plan with your people as it relates to having an incident, then how do you know it's going to work? You know, all you have is some words on paper. You don't actually have a plan. Um, now, there's lots of different kinds of tabletops. Um, and we talk about different ones. You know, we've done uh, tabletop podcasts and stuff about them. One of the tabletops that um, I like to do for experienced people, for experienced IR teams, is a live system tabletop. You literally go unplug something and see what happens. When you're sitting around a table and talking about an incident, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. And you can learn a lot. When you're doing role playing, you can learn a lot. When you're doing decision making tabletops, you can learn a lot. But there is this concept of, okay, now it's real. Mm -hmm. You don't want to test your IR plan during an incident. 
and you're not going to take your whole system down, but you can't take down a server. Thunk. Now go. And you see how people react. Um, in, in martial arts. So I, I, I've done martial arts my whole life, pretty much my whole life. And, uh, there is very much a difference when you are sparring with pads on and when you're sparring without pads on. People use different techniques. They react differently when you don't have two inches of padding mm -hmm. on those knuckles or on those feet. That is how I equate certain kinds of tabletops. There are some tabletops you want to see how people react. Um, I don't remember who it was who, who did the Chaos Monkey, uh, where they had something... Uh, they had a software program that would go and shut. Maybe it was uh, Amazon or Netflix or someone. Uh, but it would shut down different segments of their network. And the whole point was to cause chaos. You wanted to make sure your system was resilient to that right. sort of thing. Well, that's the same kind of thing we're doing here. You want to make sure your team is resilient to the real stress of having a, an outage. So, thunk, that's a now off. What do you do? Um, and you test them. You test the team because... The incident, you don't want the incident to test them. You want the incident just to be resolved. So the incident happens, we work through the process, we go through the, you know. If you could have an incident response team that had no adrenaline rush, you could have a really successful incident response, probably. Um, because they're not making rash decisions. They're going through the process. They're going, okay, yeah, here's the steps one, step two, step three, step four. We go down, we do, we uh, initiate the incident response, we may initiate disaster recovery, we may have to incident business continuity. It's just all part of the process. So um, that's, I think, is an important aspect is testing the team on the plan, because the team is the plan, by the way, um, and seeing how they react. First, you do it with conversations. You just do, let's see, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do it on short notice? Yes, okay. Now let's put a little bit more stress on it and a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And then you do as much as you can without, you know, negative repercussions, of course. But you have to see how the team reacts. Well, and I think one of the things that I've seen sometimes we'll do in a in a tabletop. So you walk in, you present the scenario. But maybe as people start to say, oh, we do this, you say, wait, your incident command person got the flu two days yeah. before this and is absolutely out. Okay, how do you adjust who knows what that person knows? And even if somebody knows, yep. is there a clarity on, okay, this person's out, suddenly this person is point, or this person knows this part, or is it, we had a plan, one person got sick. Yeah. Oh, no, the plan doesn't work. Well, and I love killing people during my tabletops. Um, I just love doing it. So He, he means, like, in the tabletop, talking yes, yes, about yes, it. Yes, yes, In the scenario, um, in fact... Uh, I had a tabletop uh, several months ago now that the person who was normally the IT leader and the incident response leader couldn't make it to the tabletop. Oh, wow. So he called me up and he says, listen, I'm not going to be there. Like, I'm okay with that. I mean, I, sure. Yeah, this is easy. And I absolutely used that. It's like, all right, such and such is not here. What do you do? And every time they said, well, you just call such and such. This is why I like, I don't like killing people off, by the way, but this is why it's so important to kill them off because if they, if, if there is this last little hook of it, well, we'll just wait till they get back. We'll just call them. We'll just do this. No, 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 no. They're gone. They are hit by bus. They are, you know, what do you do? That's, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the key components of an instant command structure is you have your backups because again you're only supposed to run about eight hours or so until you have to get a replacement in so you should have these replacements mm -hmm. of people that are trained to do that job if you have a senior network engineer you need to have two or three depending on what it is um or you need to have the right playbooks that a regular it person can come in and start to do that job so as you're otherwise doing these tabletops absolutely you need to take someone out of the picture because every time I hear, well, we're just going to call this person. Well, we're just going to call this person. We're just going to call this person. That's not incident response. That might be business continuity that you have to contact this person and keep the business going, but it's not incident response. Incident response is what happens. What is What do you do in the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario, that person is not 
there, well, now we still have to function. We still have to do the incident. Um, I was talking to a group, uh, I guess it was a few weeks ago, and we were kind of going through that process. And uh, it was interviews. I was doing interviews with an organization asking if they had, the, if they knew their incident response plan. Um, it's because your whole organization needs to understand what your incident response plan is, at least at a basic level. And their incident response plan was call this person, call this person, call this person, call this person, call this person. It's like, no, that is not the incident response plan. That is just hoping they're going to answer their phone. What do you do if they don't? What are your next steps? Do you engage another person? Do you engage an email? What, you know, what if the email is down to you? What do you do? That is what incident response is all about is about being able to deal with the incident regardless of the people that's there and being able to be successful at it. Now, we at Alias do incident response. We can come into an organization, and we have. There is no incident response plan. There are no people there. We get a minimal amount of information. You know, just go, okay, where's your data center floor? And even that, sometimes we have to go search for it. Um, where is your network head in closet? Sometimes we have to search for that. But once we are there, we build a new plan. We start sometimes from scratch yeah. because we have what works for us. You know, when we walk in, we know what has worked in other, or other organizations and we know what, how to be successful with that. So sometimes we walk in, the organization has been down for days on end and we come in and our job is to get them back up. So we have that process, we have that training, we have that experience, but we also have that, that, that mindset of true incident response. Not a single person, um, I hate to say it, not a single person is irreplaceable. Right. You know, I can step in, Tanner can step in, Hickman can step in, you could step in. I mean, it's any one of us could step in and say, all right, First, are people okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Have we stopped the threat? Have we stopped the bleeding? Okay. Do we know where it came from? Okay. And we start working through the process. And we have our plans that we have. And honestly, we're, from my experience, what I have seen since I've been here for, I don't know, 10 months or so, um, we, are, we are successful at that because of that team interaction. Right. Uh, because of that plan that we've built and that we've tested it over and over and over again. Right. And I think from sort of, not an outside view, but a little bit, I'm on our, we use Teams and I'm on our security team ch chat mm -hmm. and my phone will just start blowing up because, and I'll pull it up, I'm like, okay, here's an incident response and it's everybody. Oh, yeah. It's everybody in the SOC, it's engineers, it's wherever yep. they are. Sometimes it's even Donovan, our CEO, jumping in yep. and saying, okay, have we done this? Here's something I can see. Do you guys see this? Yeah. And I think that's, so critical to, I didn't, I don't, I don't think I expected that when I started the job because, yeah. you know, you sort of think, oh, this person takes care of this. And instead saying, no, it's all hands on deck. We're going to figure this out. Everybody's in, there is that switch off. Yep. And I think realizing, um, you know, part of that question and part of knowing your people is when do we engage a company for an incident response? Who do we have on site? But yep. given who we have, if we have the one guy we probably need to trigger that sooner yeah. because no matter how good he or she is, they just can't do it all by themselves yes. as opposed yes. to a large team who has experience, who's gone through tabletops. Yep. Okay. Maybe they can handle it all themselves. Yep. Maybe they can get a lot farther in, but that seems like that's that human element of, well, is how do we build into the plan when outside support is definitively needed? Yes. The other thing about our team that I really, really like, and I and I love being here because of it, is everyone will support one another. Yeah, I have gone into organizations where there's internal fighting. You know, IT doesn't like networking, doesn't like mm -hmm. programmers, it doesn't like, and it, you just you can't be successful at that. The reason why we all jump on that on that teams whenever there's an incident is because we're supporting one another. Mm -hmm. You know, if there is something that I can do, I'm a CISO. My job is a CISO. I do compliance. I do risk. Um, I help build systems. I help build policies and procedures. But I've got a lot of incident response um, uh, experience in my background. I may not be as good as our some of our IR engineers here, but I can jump in and I can help because I want them to feel like they're supported. 
You know, if there's something that they can't do because they don't have the time, well, I'll do it. You right. know, you want me to look through our logs? Okay, I'll look through our logs. Or even something physical like we need, we have our, our snafu that's our incident response in a box. Yes. Somebody has to physically get that there. So yep. that's not glamorous, but that's crucial. And maybe if you're the person who's not immediately working on networking and understanding that, great, I can drive 30 minutes and drop this off and plug it yeah. in. That's, yeah. that's easy. Or for me, doing the political stuff. Yeah. If I need to go talk to the board, if I need to go talk to senior leadership, absolutely. Let the engineers do what they're doing. I'll go run interference. I'll go help. I'll go answer questions. You know, I can be that front end person for them so that they can focus on the incident and bringing things back up. So we all work as a team. That is a fundamental aspect of the incident command structure is having that everyone knows their job, does their job well, knows what they're supposed to do. And what I love about our team is everyone can hop off, mm -hmm. you know, everyone. I know that if I were, if I, if I called up Donovan, it's like, Hey, I can't do this anymore. Can you take over? He's right there. Right. Um, he can do the same thing with me. Um, we could do the same thing if, uh, let's say Tanner, uh, or one of our engineers is not able to, um, uh, let's say he's got to go fix the, the snafu for some reason, but he's running a scan. Well, We'll just take over. Yeah. We'll run the scan. You go fix the snafu. You go do this. You go do this. Um, so it, it really is important to have that support within the incident. And it seems like so much of what we're talking about is sort of getting ego out. I had a I had a one of my best um, mentors ever. He had a great phrase for this was after a, an event. He said an autopsy without blame, which struck people as kind of morbid at first. Yeah. But the idea that you're going back over it without blame, saying, you know, in that sense, it's dead, right? Yeah. The incident's yeah. over or mostly over. And I think part of the question is what's, this is kind of the last part, is what's the culture of an organization with respect to the people who are involved? And I, what, one thing I see that really concerns me because I've, I've done some rubber fishing is when you have an organization that has a one and done, yeah. you got caught on a phishing email you're out. Well, in my mind, and I, yeah. again, I know there's levels of severity, but in my mind, you've just actually created a culture where you've incentivized me yeah. not to report, which yes. means maybe I don't report and I thought it was a phishing email and I'm really hoping it wasn't and it turns out well, or maybe I actually keep the company from knowing about something yeah. really crucial for two, three, four, five, ten days and suddenly... Yeah it's exploded, um, do do we see that as an opportunity for training, for development? Do we see, do we take away the embarrassment? So if you're having a tabletop and somebody's like, I don't know what to do or um, what do I do other than call this person, is that th there's going to be embarrassment that's human, but is there, okay, now we know something, not actually so much about you, we know something about our systems. Sure. We know something about our plan. Sure. We know something about how everybody relates. How do we help you actually become that part of our defense? Because now you realize you weren't, but okay, fine. You go off the table. How do we help you? So I've got to kind of hedge what I say here because okay. um, the answer is Yes. I think it's important to build that community within the organization that people trust you and they respect you as a team, as an incident response team and as a cybersecurity team. Um, I've been very fortunate. The organizations I've worked for, there was a lot of trust. Now that trust was built over 22 years mm -hmm. of being an employee there. People knew me. So if I says, I need to do this thing or I need you to do it, they would. Um, I did not, um, here's an example. Every time someone sent me an email asking me if it was phishing, and this could be hundreds of times a day, some days, once a day, every day someone did, I wanted to be sure to thank them for that. Mm. I replied to every single one of them. 99.9% .9 of every one of them. I may have missed one here and there, but I would reply to them. It's like, Hey, no, we know about this. I appreciate you. You know, thank you for sending this. 
what that caused was people would tell me before they click on something, like, hey, is this, uh, Jonathan, is, is this a phishing? But they would also say, Jonathan, I got caught again. I, I clicked on the link. Okay, let's figure it out. And But it was that communication. It was about trust and respect. Now, I think that's incredibly important. I think it's important to build that trust and respect with the organization so that you can have good conversations. You can deal with those sorts of things. Um, and people don't feel embarrassed, or if they do feel embarrassed, they still trust you enough mm-hmm. to come and talk to you. However, there's another aspect to it. And as a CISO, this is kind of the bad part of the job. There are times when even a single mistake yeah. can hurt someone or hurt the organization to the point that you can not have them there. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, had a, a situation where somebody made a, a, a mistake, uh, made a poor decision, and I had to recommend to the organization to not have that person in that position any longer. Mm-hmm. Now, I didn't tell them to fire them. I told them they couldn't, they should not be in the position they were in because they had a lot of access, they had a lot of control uh, on the systems or whatever. So I had to do an official CISO recommendation saying this person, because of this risk factor, cannot be in this position any longer. And it was a mistake. Mm-hmm. It was a poor decision. But sometimes those poor decisions can get people killed. So there has to be balance. Um, so when we are dealing with like phishing campaign, people are going to get caught. IT people get caught. Mm-hmm. You know, they, it. It's just, it happens. You're not thinking. It, you, you're talking about timing. Two o'clock yep. is a great time to fish an organization because it's after lunch. Mm-hmm. That food is settling. They're getting tired. They don't really care. They're clicking on stuff. So uh, it happens. Um, the severity of right. the risk is the issue. If you're doing an incident... Um, and someone caused the problem and it was an accident. Okay. I can almost guarantee you they're not gonna make that accident again. Right. Um, you spend $250,000 on incident response because if someone made an accident or made an oopsie, (laughs) they will generally go, I am never touching a computer again. I'm never going to make that, that, that choice. However, um, in some cases you have to look at it and go, okay. They might actually do this again. They're high right. risk. So, uh, nope, they can't be there. You know, So there has to be a balance. There has to be an evaluation. But that evaluation has to be done after the incident. No knee-jerk reactions. Um, do the after-incident report. Do the, the post-mortem on the, on the root cause. Determine what actually happened. And then wait. Give yourself several days a week before any decisions are made because everyone, even a day later, two days later, three days, are still excited about the incident. They're nervous, they're stressed out, they're whatever. Don't make rash decisions during the incident or even right after the incident response. Wait before you ruin someone's life because you have to terminate them or whatever the case may be. And it may take weeks before you actually know what happened. Yeah. You know, that's the root cause analysis. You may not know immediately. You do your best, and you try to figure it out. You try to bring the org- you bring the organization back up. You have business continuity, but you may not know what happens. Mm-hmm. Some cases you may never know. But you know? I, it sounds like that's the human element as well of be aware of yourself. That there needs to be that time after yeah. you, you, your immediate reaction is almost always probably going to be somewhat flawed. Yes, and it seems too like there's that that need to wait because what if yes this person made this mistake. But it really reveals there was a vulnerability that might have gotten exploited at some time anyway. So, yes, are they still responsible for X, Y, Z? So it seems like a part of it is that that human element of waiting, knowing yourself, knowing that immediate reaction isn't going to be good, but also that knowledge that maybe that person made a mistake, but it actually reveals a vulnerability that was there anyway. Yes. It could be exploited. So... That seems like that's both parts of this person made this mistake. Maybe even it was a severe mistake. Maybe you still do have to act because it became an issue of safety. 
at the same time, maybe you don't, or even if you have had to do that, you say, wow, this actually revealed something not even about our plan, but about yeah. our system. We have something entirely other to address. And I know from our side, sometimes getting that report back to the customer takes some time because it's okay, we have to process. We have notes, but all those notes are, we're trying to figure things out in real time. Yeah. Let's let's not just let's figure out what happened. What did we find that's important, and what's the coherent narrative to give of where did this start? What are the steps? How did we react? How did you react? Okay, where do we end? That just takes some time to give a coherent story back to a customer. Yeah, and incident response is, you know, uh, we talk about this all the time. Incident response starts well before the incident happens because you're always evaluating, you're always checking, you're doing your checklist. And then your incident happens, and your incident response happens. But your incident response doesn't end when the incident ends. Right. It is that you know, that that post mortem report of what happened. More importantly, it's all the stuff you do six months from then, mm-hmm. a year from then. Um, are you actually making changes in the organization? Firing someone, which may be needed, or you know, sending them to jail, whatever you know, may be needed. But that doesn't necessarily solve the problem. Right. You know, what if someone else does the same thing? Mm -hmm. Have you solved that particular issue? And I think that's what's important for the after action report is, you know, what are you doing? You know, how are you solving this issue? How are you solving it from that individual in terms of risk, but also the rest of the organization? And that should be, I mean, it could be six months from then, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for you to fully implement changes. Uh, Some organizations move slowly. Yeah. Well, and it, I think it's so helpful when you talk about, you know, it's it's about the safety of people in organization, because I think that also takes the ego out of it. Ha- having been in a leadership position where I had to make sort of decisions of, do I fire this person? Do I not extend another contract? That can be really hard. And, and it should be. It should be something that you take seriously. But if if you remove the ego of, this is my decision because of how I think or feel, say, yep. okay, this person created a danger to physical, mm-hmm. to to people, or to a physical element of our organization, or this person created a danger to our network, which yep. would then impact other people. Okay, that becomes a decision out on the table of yeah. how serious was this, how serious was the threat, not thinking about the individual person, but was this a significant enough threat yeah. that we need to take this action? Now, obviously, it affects that person. You have, you want to think about that like this is a huge decision. But that takes my ego out of it to say, yeah, this is a somewhat objective decision yeah. based upon our risk and and what could happen. I uh, I had a situation years and years and years ago. It was a lot of years. <laughs> I'm getting old. Um, just wisdom and experience. That's, that's all it is. Yeah. And gray hairs, lots of gray hairs, uh, lots of gray beard now. Um, I had a situation where, uh, I had an employee who, uh, he had a really big success. Um, they had a, a major project that he had, he, there was a team of them, but it was him specifically that he had completed. Uh, he did a great job at it. Uh, he decided after the job was done, after he was completed that day, it was like the you know, the last computer deployed. I don't remember what the project was now, but the last computer deployed, he was going to he was going to have a drink. Um, so he started drinking at about four uh, that afternoon, and uh, uh, no one reported it. No one said anything. They just kind of let him drink, um, and they campus. Um, police or the the police uh, of the organization um, found him on the data center floor. And that was a major issue. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you've ever been on a data center floor, you know, it can, it can be dangerous. I mean, you've got fire suppression systems. I mean, you got all kinds of different things. Uh, you got high voltage coming into the PDU. I mean, there's a variety of stuff. Well, I ended up having to terminate him. Um, you know, I worked with HR. We suspended him first. You know, suspended. And uh, we ended up having to terminate him. Now, I tell the story not about the fact that we had to terminate him, but I was 
very afraid that he that was going to spiral him down into some version of suicide, mm-hmm. either drink himself to death or whatever. And that really bothered me. Um, I knew I had to do it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I knew I had to protect the organization. And then, but I also knew that it was going to take him and possibly put him in a really bad situation. So I asked him um, when I read the letter to him. Of course, the way you, we, the way we did it was write a letter. Uh, he couldn't come back to the organization, so I had to to uh, uh, call him up, and I read the letter to him, told him he was no longer employed, and he understood. But I asked him to go call his family, and uh, said, "You know, please go call your parents." You know, I, I, you know, I only had certain amount of what I could do, you know, because he was no longer working for me. Um, but I, I asked him to go do that and he did. And he went and got help. And his dad came, um, oh, I don't know, three or four weeks later to pick up a box, you know, of his stuff at his desk. And he thanked me. He shook my hand. He thanked me. And he said, I really appreciate you doing that. He's in, you know, recovery, he hasn't drank, he hasn't done this, and, you know, all this different stuff. But what that really taught me was the job that we do is about people. Mm -hmm. If someone puts people at risk, you have to do something about it. Um, But you also have to be at least somewhat considerate of the change that you're making to the people that you're going to have that effect on. If you have to let someone go or if you have to embarrass them, make somebody do training. So you have to do it with with grace. You have to do it with empathy. Um, but sometimes you do have to do it. That isn't the job. Incident response is about people. Uh, systems don't need incident response. A computer is sitting there running. If it doesn't have any other uh, input of any kind other than things will fail, um, you don't need incident response. It's when an attacker gets in or someone makes a bad decision, or bad code gets in, or whatever, that's when you... So incident response is fundamentally about people interaction. People interaction with systems, or doing something, or making decisions, whatever. So with that said, when we build our incident response plans, when we're teaching people about incident response, when we're going through the tabletops, it's all about people, Mm -hmm. and about how people are going to react during that incident how you're going to handle people in the incident. How are you going to manage people in the incident? You talk about food earlier. That's managing people. Yeah. You, you got to feed them. Yeah. You got to make sure that they can live. Um, talking with the board, their people, you're going to have to engage that board, give them what they need to know to make decisions to help support you. So all of these things, I had a, uh, a, C, a, a CIO who um, she... We were doing an incident, major incident. We were, you know, huge network outage. Um, but she wanted to help. Just absolutely. She she kept calling me and said, Jonathan, what's going on? How are you doing? What can I do to help? And it got to the point where it was late enough in the evening that I needed to get dinner to people. And I told her that over the phone. It's like, I don't know how to get food. She goes, don't worry about it. I will take care of it. It's like, Okay. What do you want? And I told her, it's like, you know, this, this, and this, and this. And she came maybe half an hour later, and she's carrying, like, boxes of tacos and bags of burgers. And she came, coming down. And she was in, like, a very formal um, gown. And I'm like, what did I call you away from? And she goes, I, we were going to a dinner or whatever, but you guys are more important. And I got, I get a lot of respect for her that died because she stopped what she was doing to go buy fast food for us. Yeah. It doesn't seem glamorous. No, no. And she did not even hesitate. It was just absolutely. I'll take care of it. And I didn't think about it again because I knew she was going to do it because her response was about people. Incident response is about people. And as long as we keep that in mind as we're doing stuff um, before the incident, during the incident, after the incident, for the people that caused the incident, the people that supported the incident, the people that's going to ask questions after the incident, 
as long as we keep that in mind as we're doing our incident response plan, then incident response can be successful. Yeah, I think one of the things that I love the best is uh, we had a company that we did an incident response with um, and actually helped us develop a case study. And there was this brilliant line by one of their people that said, alias treated us like partners, not patients. Yes. And I think what he meant was when we came in, um, no shame, no judgment, nothing yeah. like this was done. But also one of the things that I've seen with our guys a lot that that is really encouraging is they'll explain. Yeah. So it, it'd be easy to have a company come in and say, you guys go sit off to the side. We're going to handle this. We'll be yeah. back later. But instead saying, hey, this is what we're seeing, or this is why we're using this tool, or hey, we found this. Um, we need your wisdom about your network because this looks like this to us. Yep. But we have enough experience to say we may be reading it wrong. Yeah. And so to have that sense of collaboration of a company that calls us in already knows that they can't fully handle it by themselves. Right. Right. So instead saying, hey, let's partner with you. Let's help you learn so that one, we can get through this. Yep. It will help you know the after action report better. But then also it means and we hope there's not another incident, but if there is, you will be more equipped yes. to step in and either not need us or not need us as quickly, or yeah. it may be one of those phone calls of, hey, we're seeing this, and we go, have you checked this? And you say yes, and we get off the phone, and you totally take care of it, and to us, that's a win, because now a company is able to deal with their own incident in a more mature way and, and truly um, see us as that resource for we're here to help get you restored yeah. and equip your people so that then you're you're in a better position, yep. Um, regardless of whether or not you employ us or not. Yeah, yeah. No, you know what I said earlier about you know we can come in and from scratch and do what we need to do. Um, that's not ideal, right? You know we don't like doing that, but we can. You know we do it a lot when they don't have IT or they don't have IT security. Um, but you're absolutely right. If if we go in and help an organization and they never call us again for incident response. We're just tickled pink. Yeah. We don't want the attackers to win. We don't want there to be bad things. And if we can help improve that, that's that's what we want to do. We do want you to call us back, and we want to help you improve. We want to help improve in the skill sets, but we would very much rather do tabletops mm -hmm. or firewall audits or pen tests or things that are a bit more controlled than having him come and do an incident response and, you know— because it, it is a uh, it is a process. It is stressful for you know the organization, and it's hard to deal with. So we would much like to do you know preventative maintenance or preventative controls as opposed to picking up the pieces afterward. Well, thank you, Jonathan. This has been a fantastic conversation. Absolutely. This was fun. Yeah, this has been great. So um, thank you for watching, and we'd encourage you to check out our other podcast episodes. We talk about all things cybersecurity, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks. Thank you.